Hi everyone, and welcome to my very brief presentation on Suboxone, or buprenorphine and naloxone. I'd like to first say that this is for educational purposes only, and nothing in this presentation is intended to be medical advice. So, the purpose of this presentation is to describe how Suboxone works, specifically what is uh, buprenorphine and then what is the naloxone component and why are they combined in one in one dosage form and why why are they administered why is that administered sublingually which is under the tongue or in the cheek which is called the buccal membrane and why why is it not uh, swallowed um, and why is it not injectable okay so as you can see here I have the two major dosage forms that would be the the thin strip uh, which has the N8, for example, on there. That's one one of them that you can get. That's a, a thin strip that would be used under the tongue or in the cheek or the tablet, that, which is typically used sublingually, which, again, is under the tongue. So, again, Suboxone has two major active ingredients, just to show you the actual names, because I already stated them. That would be buprenorphine, which is an opioid receptor agonist. I'm not going to get into great depth on what that means, other than for the purposes of this presentation, an agonist just means that it's an activator, um, and specifically it activates the mu opioid receptors, which we associate with things like um, pain relief, um, respiratory depression, constipation, um, and you know even the euphoria, uh, the euphoria that we think of. They're all associated pr primarily with that mu opioid receptor. Okay, an agonist is an activator that actually um, causes all those effects. Naloxone, as most people probably know by now, is the opposite that blocks opioids effects. That is an opioid receptor antagonist. So what is Suboxone prescribed for? First of all, a lot of you may already know this. You may be taking it, you may have a relative that takes it, or a patient, um, but you just, you know, you, you may or may not be interested in what what is it actually used for primarily. And the simple answer is, uh, patients that are um, addicted to opioids or opiates, which I won't get into the difference between an opi opioid and opiate in this presentation, uh, but for the most part, it's the same idea. Um, any substance that activates the opioid receptors, um, people that are dependent on those could be heroin, it could be a prescription one. Um, how do we get them off of those? So Suboxone is one of the one of the the drug products that's used for that purpose. So I want to focus on the first component, uh, which is the component that actually activates the opioid receptors. That would be buprenorphine. You can get buprenorphine alone as a product, uh, but the purposes of this presentation, uh, the main purpose is to explain why it's used in combination with naloxone. Buprenorphine is an opioid with a lower ceiling effect than, than others. That's really important for everyone to understand. Um, first of all, that so so what what are the effects that I'm talking about? So those effects will be every, almost everything you could think of that opioids would do. That would be, again, causing euphoria, but causing pain relief, which is a good thing, right? The second one's a good thing. Um, causing uh, constipation, causing so many other things, respiratory depression, a lot of side effects. Most of those side effects are directly related to um, the effects on opioid receptors. Okay, and, and there may be some other receptors that are involved for euphoria and things like that. Uh, but we're going to focus on um, the opioid receptor. So, so buprenorphine, when I say it has a lower ceiling effect, that means if you took grams and grams and grams of it, which nobody should do, or I'm not advising anyone to do that, there is a ceiling. So that means you reach a limit uh, of its maximal effect. Um, so every drug has a limit for its max. But other drugs like uh, morphine has a much higher maximum effect. Okay, so if you you had um, an escalation of a, a morphine or or heroin um, or a, an, again a stronger agonist dose, you'd reach a higher maximum effect. I'm going to show a, a graph on that in just a little bit to make it more clear. So even with an overdose, you have a limit to the the extent of the side effects. Okay, the only warning I'll give, a big warning here, is that if you're combining buprenorphine with any other drug that can cause the same side effects, 
you know, you may not be protected in that case, right? If you're using buprenorphine with a benzodiazepine, such as Ativan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, those, uh, that combination could still give you severe respiratory depression if you, if you have too much. Okay, so uh, once you're combining it with some other things, then, then any of these rules are kind of, uh, you know, a moot point at, you know, at that point. So it, the reason why it is having a ceiling effect is because it is a partial agonist. Um, so I'm going to describe exactly what a partial agonist means um, pharmacologically on the next slide. Uh, but first here, I'll, I'll describe, so why do we use a partial agonist in opioid addicted patients? Okay, so in other words, why do we use an opioid with a ceiling effect? The reason for that is if a, in a, uh, a patient that ab has abused opioids in the past, we're trying to get them away from that. If they take extra buprenorphine, they, they won't be able to get to the same high that they would ever get to with a stronger agonist because of the ceiling effect. And that means even if 100% of their opioid receptors are occupied with this drug, they still won't get the same maximum effect that they would get with morphine, uh, heroin, uh, oxycodone. Okay, so it's, it's at the level of the receptor. You're literally binding to it and, and changing the receptor's conformation in a different way than you would with these stronger agonists. So it could never reach the maximum effect that you would see with other ones. So that said, um, so what does it actually look like on a graph? So on this graph, I have on the y-axis, the response, we'll say max pain relief or the percentage of max pain relief, the percentage of euphoria, anything associated with the mu opioid receptor. On the x-axis is the concentration of opioid agonist in the blood. Now a pharmacologist, which is what I am, um, and a toxicologist, what they would typically look at is the concentration of the drug in the blood or the opioid in the blood in the amount of receptors that are occupied. Um, for, our, for our purposes, I think it's just easier to look at it as the percent of max pain relief or euphoria, okay, because this is uh, for a general audience. But the idea is that if we had a full agonist, uh, believe it or not, this is endogenous, this is already in your body, it's called leuencephalin. Leuencephalin, to my knowledge, is probably the strongest agonist of the opioid, mu opioid receptor that we are aware of, and that's already, like I said, it's already in the body. So that would give you the maximum response. The maximum response is defined, honestly, it's just defined as whatever chemical we've found that produces the highest possible response, we call that the maximum. So it means something in the future could be discovered that produces a higher maximum, but this is where our baseline is right now, um, highest maximum, and that's leuencephalin. Believe it or not, um, tramadol is an opioid receptor agonist, particularly it's metabolite, and that's only a partial agonist. That means if I keep giving more and more and more and more and more, guess what? I still reach a plateau that's lower than leuencephalin or other full agonists. So I can never reach the same effective, effectiveness in pain relief or the same effectiveness in euphoria. Okay, so we don't use Suboxone for pain relief, use it for uh, getting a patient that's addicted, getting them away from the stronger opioids. Okay, now, this is just tramadol, but if I went with buprenorphine, it's, an e it's one of the weakest partial agonists. That means a ceiling effect or maximum effect is much lower than, than the majority of opioids, uh, probably all of them that I'm aware of. Okay, so that means it's going to be, you know, really hard to get any significant high. However, if you happen to have, again, a patient going through withdrawal, you, could, you should be able to get enough of an effect to reduce the withdrawal severity. And that's the whole idea. You know, they feel like they're getting some stimulation, some maybe some of the high, some of um, you know, reversing some of the agitation that comes from withdrawal and things like that. Um, but it's not enough that it's going to be like heroin or something that strong. Okay, so just to reiterate, a partial agonist cannot fully activate its receptor, even when all copies of the receptor are occupied with the drug. And those receptors will be on the cell membrane, of course, and you could saturate them and you'll still get, you know, a lower max. And that, again, that's a really interesting concept that I won't get into in too much detail, but it means that when it binds to the receptor, 
the same receptor as these other ones, it does something different to the receptor. Okay, and, and the pharmacologists believe there, there might be an infinite number of conformations or shapes that the receptor can take and then um, and that'll subsequently affect what happens inside the cell and that signaling pathway. So naloxone, structurally, it's very similar. Um, both of these drugs, naloxone and buprenorphine, both of those chemicals are pretty bulky on this amine group. But naloxone is a pure opioid receptor, um, it's a mu opioid receptor antagonist. So that means um, it's it has no partial agonist stability. It has no full agonist stability. That means it's just a, essentially just a blocker. Um, for simplicity's, simplicity's sake, we'll just call it a blocker. It's Of course, it's commonly used to reverse the respiratory depression from opioid overdose. Most of us probably know about naloxone or Narcan as you know, it's used in emergencies, again, for someone who, who's overdosed. So on the surface, it, so if this is blocking opioid activity, but buprenorphine is supposed to give us opioid activity in, in these patients um, that are independent, um, it would appear that this is futile, right? That buprenorphine would, would be opposed by naloxone and the medication uh, suboxone would be pointless. So what is the rationale for having an opioid antagonist combined with an agonist? And I'm going to answer that question um, in just, you know, basically in a, within a few minutes here. So um, this is going to be basically explanation of why, uh, why we combine an antagonist with an agonist of the opioid receptor. And this is one of the really interesting instances where it all comes down to something called biopharmaceutics, and that's the absorption. Uh, I'll call it uh, differential absorption of buprenorphine and naloxone. So, so just to, to simplify it, it means that depending on the route of administration, for example, sublingual or buccal, which would be in the cheek, uh, per oral means that technically that is swallowing it, so by way of the oral mucosa, you're swallowing it, goes to the stomach, goes to the intestines. Or parenteral means any injectable form for the most part, which means the enteral is intestinal, but this is, you know, outside of that or near intestinal. But it essentially, you know, I'm just breaking down the word there, but essentially it just means injected. Okay, it could be IV, it could be intermuscular, it could be uh, subcutaneous. It's all injected. So why so what why is there a difference and what is the difference between these dosage uh, or administration routes so first of all if you took it sublingually what will happen is the buprenorphine will get absorbed very well but the naloxone is not absorbed very well there so what will happen is it, you won't get that inhibition effect you'll mostly get the the just the buprenorphine in the blood and you'll get that nice well kind of subtle stimulation of the mu opioid receptor. If you took it per orally or swallowed it, the problem is, well, neither naloxone nor buprenorphine would get absorbed. In fact, they would start getting absorbed they, uh, through the intestinal wall, but then they would get modified in the liver, and that's called first pass metabolism because it, everything, for the most part, everything that you swallow goes in to the blood uh, in the portal vein, which goes right to the liver before it goes to the rest of the body. And then at that point, the liver can do what it wants with it. And, and in this case, it metabolizes naloxone and buprenorphine. They both get broken down and neither one of them will be effective orally. But what about this? Th this is the big concern here. What if I gave, if so, you know, someone gave this by dissolving, if you could dissolve this sublingual film or the tablet, if you got a bunch of it for some reason and you dissolved it and tried to filter it or purify it, and then you injected it, well, doesn't that allow a patient to abuse it? Well, remember we have, first of all, we have our first kind of uh, checkpoint or our first check, we'll say checks and balances, um, or the two checks and balances. The first one would be the fact that we have a partial agonist. But that's that's not the focus here. But I'll just say, because it is a partial agonist, even if someone injected it, it should not have a strong effect, right? It definitely will not. However, 
if you combined it with something else and injected it, um, yeah, combine it with another opioid and injected it, there might be concern about getting a strong effect. The reason why that concern is not uh, not valid is because once you inject it, 100% of the naloxone will get into the blood and 100% of the buprenorphine will get into the blood, but then the amount of naloxone available is enough to completely block the effect of the buprenorphine or other medications, other opioids. So if someone tried to abuse it through injection, they would get no effect, okay? In fact, it might reverse any effect that was there from a prior dose. So there's no um, incentive to abuse it this way. There's no incentive to swallow it. So there's really no easy way, no no way, you know, unless you had a really, uh, you know, really sophisticated background in chemistry to separate these two things out. It is, uh, there's really no incentive to, to try to abuse it in this way. So what I'm showing you is the outcome is that sublingually or, or in the buccal membrane, buprenorphine is, is significantly absorbed in the blood. Naloxone is not orally or per orally. It's going to go and get um, into the intestine, but then into the liver, get broken down. So you get a very low concentration in the blood of both of those. So there's all, uh, essentially no noticeable effect. And then IV, they both get in. The naloxone then can shine and do its job, which is to block buprenorphine. So this doesn't work for a patient if they want to get high. Per oral doesn't work. Sublingual won't work because it's base, essentially a slower slower route. Or how could I put it? It is um, right. It's it's not a way to rapidly get. You're not going to rapidly get a lot of buprenorphine in your system this way because of the dosage form. Okay, but you will avoid getting too much naloxone, so you will get some effectiveness or efficacy. Okay, so that's it. I mean, that's that's. You know, I just wanted to make this a very kind of clear cut, um, kind of like a little chunk of information on exactly uh, why Suboxone is formulated the way it is, why it is used sublingually and not orally, and how it uh, deters abuse. So thank you for listening.